The Florent Elk Grove community that I remember was a very busy, bustling, strawberry and grape shipping, fruit shipping center uh, right along the S Southern Pacific Railroad track and um, Florin Road. Well, that was the center. And so about 2,500 of us lived in an area around uh, 10 um, mile radius and they farmed in uh, various areas clear up to Elk Grove and Slough House and, and uh, Mills and uh, Mayhew and Perkins area and some in Franklin. All of those farmers brought their produce to ship, be shipped in Florin. Uh, Florin was the sh uh, economic center where they brought their produce, but it was also a center where they uh, got the social center and uh, that's where they got their groceries and there were two uh, churches, a Buddhist church and a Protestant, Methodist Protestant church. And so this was a religious center too. And uh, people gathered together uh, during the year to um, uh, celebrate their weddings or funerals and all of that. So that it was kind of a close-knit community and uh, we were about nine miles southeast of Sacramento but um, we were also very conspicuous because there happened to be more than 60 percent of us were Japanese uh, farmers and their children, American citizen children. And so it was a concentrated community where there were more Japanese uh, than uh, other European descendant people. And this uh, created some problems, especially on the West Coast. Before the war, for 10 to 30 to 40 years, there was a great movement of anti-Oriental sentiment. And at occasions when they had their uh, political campaign, always there would be some other articles about uh, the terrible uh, immigrant group that was uh, growing in number and were working too hard to be a competition to other farmers and that we were taking away farmlands that were important. And so we were severely criticized for many things, but we were busy in Florin and Elk Grove area raising our strawberries and busy during the May and uh, April and May uh, harvest uh, peak when we were shipping even 130 carloads of strawberries. Now these were refrigerated carloads. And strawberries were so perishable that they had to hurry to get them to the market. And so early in the morning they would pick these berries and the trucks would be all over the entire area picking them up as we picked, the farmers picked them and they would quickly deliver them to the, the uh, stores if the stores wanted them for that day. So there were trucks traveling all over Sacramento area and to other cities. And then the, the largest portion of the of strawberries at the peak of the season then were, were loaded right into the refrigerated cars. And by midnight that night, the trains would start rolling away with these carloads of strawberries that were picked that day. And they would try to deliver them to uh, cities uh, in the West Coast. It didn't even reach Chicago. They were so perishable. Strawberries didn't last that long. So this was kind of a very hectic, bustling kind of a strawberry business that uh, the farmers, the Japanese uh, farmers, uh, were involved in. And my father-in-law came to Florin in 1892, and at that time there weren't too many Japanese farmers, but he remembered seeing a few Chinese uh, people working on these farms and had planted strawberries, and it seemed to have been almost the beginning of the strawberries uh, uh, raised in the Florin community. And uh, then gradually the the white landowners were pleased to have the Japanese farmers raise strawberries, which was very difficult work, stoop labor and difficult work. But someone got the idea of planting grapes in between the strawberry patches. And soon, as the two or three years time that they took to raise strawberries, these uh, farmers had the cash crop from the strawberries while they 
cultivated and took care of the young vines that took three or four years before they were ready to produce grapes. And so it was kind of a happy a discovery to work together with uh, the strawberries and grapes as uh, something that could be raised on the same piece of land. And so this is how they, after they finished pr uh, raising strawberries for three or four years and they were ready to move to a next patch, the grapes then had a pretty good start. And so then there would be a grape vineyard uh, left as each patch of berries were um, harvested and plowed under after two or three years so that the new patch could be planted. So that gradually the daring uh, grain raising Florin community was transformed, you know, from 1865 when the early farmers we remember we spoke, we have learned about uh, James Rudder and all of the people that first came to Florin area to farm and they uh, discovered that Toke grapes were very, very uh, good in the Florin soil and climate and they discovered that it was very uh, popular and uh, achieved uh, the uh, prizes were won at the state fair. So many people started to get interested in raising toke grapes, flame toke grapes, which were table grapes. And so uh, that's how Florin then gradually became a very important grape producing, strawberry producing community where strawberries and grapes were cultivated and grown together. And when strawberries were finished from that patch, they had to move to fresh soil then the, they, it left a grape vineyard started. And so in the years after Grandpa Tsukamoto in 1892 came, he saw that there were many thousand Japanese were encouraged to come to work for the white landowners to convert these grain fields into strawberries and grapes. So by the time 1941-42 came, I just remember seeing grapevines all over the whole community and we have had maps showing the farmers. Uh, there were more than 500 farmers living in various places, the Japanese farmers. And then in between, of course, there were Caucasian farmers who had come from other European countries were farming in this community. And so it was a very um, unusual community of many Japanese concentrated in the area with three or four Japanese grocery stores and three or four Japanese-run produce shipping companies. And we endured the depression years, the 10 terrible years from 30 to 40. We were just beginning to come out of that depression and farmers were beginning to uh, be able to pay back their mortgage. They all had to mortgage their land to survive through the depression. We had to depend on the grocery stores to to uh, advance money so we can eat through the winter. And this is the same way we relied on the produce shipping companies to advance money so that we could buy fertilizer and buy crates and lumber for the crates and all of that so that uh, we could uh, managed to until the harvest was uh, harvest time came and for the, all of these reasons uh, we uh, were not rich but we were hard-working struggling farmers that relied on their children to help with the farm labor most of the year until the strawberry peak season then they uh, there were laborers that came in to harvest to help us harvest strawberries but we worked, I remember picking berries until the bus came, and as soon as we came off of the bus, we went home to change our clothes and have a bite to, of snacks to, snack to eat, and then we rushed out into the fields. We were in the berry patch during weekends and all summer, uh, pulling weeds and, and uh, planting runners and, and picking strawberries in between. So it was an endless, back-breaking, tiring kind of a job. And uh, we were uh, very grateful that our parents cared about the schools and our education so that they always sent us to school and um, encouraged us to go to church so that we would get some kind of a social society kind of an environmental experience that we needed so that we grow up in this new country with a background of American heritage. And we relied on the school teachers to give us that 
and our parents always left us, uh, sent us uh, from our homes, reminding us to mind our teachers, to learn a lot from them. And we sort of looked to them as though they were our second parents. And so we have many wonderful teachers that we remember that were kind to us and helped us to feel that maybe there was a chance for us to find roots here. But uh, our parents didn't know anything about the American ways, and we relied on the schools to give us that. And we appreciate what the schools meant to the children who are people, children of immigrants. And the, and the years later, when I became a public school teacher, I remembered that. How important it was that a shy, frightened child could be given some encouragement and confidence. Because I remembered Mabel Barron, who was teaching in Elk Grove High School at this time when I was growing up in Florence. And we were all very poor. and frightened and we were shy and conscious, self-conscious about our clothing and, and everything and being a teenager in Elk Grove High School. Having been to a segregated elementary school, it was a shock for us to experience that when I first came to Florence when I was 10 and find that this was such, such an unusual community. And I, it began to make me feel very ashamed of myself. and felt humiliated and demeaned by the fact that maybe we weren't good enough to go to school with all the other children. And across the uh, track on the west side, half a mile away, there was another school for all the rest of the children. Every child in my school had Japanese faces, but all the other children, Chicanos and black children and Caucasian children, were over in the other school. And so we felt very, very demeaned and no one talked to us about it but we sort of sensed that maybe life in this country would have to be different for us. And so when Mabel Barron came into my life and I learned public speaking from her and she tried to teach me how to speak in front of people and find the courage to speak with confidence and assurance and pause here and lift your voice here and bring out the things that you want to say I practiced oration, and she coached me on that. And even though I did not qualify to speak before the Native Sons and Daughters of the Golden West had an annual oratorical contest, and I was floored by the fact that I wouldn't qualify because of my ancestry. And Mabel was, ang was very distressed to think that they had such a ruling, and she felt it was very unfair for school children to be discriminated that way, and every child had the equal right to uh, privileges of becoming a wonderful, uh, educated student. She felt very distressed, but they couldn't do anything about it. So she made up for it by coaching me and teaching me when I had the opportunity to speak in oratorical contests in the Japanese-American sponsored community. so that. This was the kind of life I lived in Florence, where we did have contact with the uh, Caucasian, the uh, rest of the American community in our, through our schools. And as we became friends, we had some friends in our community whom we met at the school. But much of our social life and our cultural life was isolated among the Japanese American people. We went to Japanese uh, language school because our parents wanted us to be able to converse with them. But as we grew up, you know, we rebelled against that. So few of us ended up not knowing how to speak to our own parents very well because we, we uh, didn't want to be bothered learning Japanese language or Japanese culture when it was so important for us to proclaim that we are Americans. And so we wanted to uh, uh, just be so ashamed of the culture and the background of our parents that we wanted to pretend that we knew nothing about it and try to tell everybody that we were just 100% Americans. And so all of these attitudes affected our knowledge and our growing years and our experiences. But among the Japanese American community, they did sponsor some oratorical contests and opportunities for us to develop our leadership training experiences and our being uh, organizing uh, clubs and groups so that we could learn to become leaders in our club groups. So this was the kind of life we lived, where we had our own uh, festivals and social functions and things. And uh, then we went to the public school and tried to learn to become 
good Americans. And so Mabel always said that my dream should be that I would someday become a bridge between the cultures, the two cultures. And I had no notion of doing anything like that when I was a junior in high school. I was ashamed of my parents and resented their background, and I didn't want to admit anything like that to anybody. But today, after all these years, after I'm 73, I find that all of her dreams for me has come true and that she never dreamed that I would end up being a school teacher, but I did. And I'm so happy that I could teach because there was a time when they told me that people of Japanese ancestry would not be hired by the public school. So way back in 1930s and 33 when I graduated Elk Grove High School and went to the College of the Pacific because Mabel was determined that I'd get there, and she got me my scholarship and got me some clothes, sewed up some old clothes and made me a wardrobe so I could get there. And my father was poor and she had to beg my father to let me go to college so that when he realized what a great teacher Mabel was, that he suddenly realized that America is a special country. But he was quite disillusioned because when he was in the fourth grade in Okinawa, he read about Abraham Lincoln. And he always felt that this was a great country, a poor man like Lincoln who could become the president of the United States. And so he always lectured to us about this wonderful country. But there are times when he was very, very upset and disappointed. But when Mabel came to ask that, he had tears as he realized you know, there were some wonderful things about this country he deeply appreciated. So I ended up going to COP, and when I did that education, the three years I had education there was important for me, because after the terrible experience we had during the war and came back, I had the opportunity to become a school teacher. There's so many, many things that we remember about the, uh, the nightmare that was our experiences in the internment year, during the internment years. I remember um, the day we left was May 29th, 1942, and we left our strawberries rotting in the field. I remember Grandpa Al's father was 75 years old and his mother was 63. He had planted every grapevine and all the persimmon trees and walnut trees in our yard. It was very hard for him to leave. And we imagined, how, you know, being uh, an old man of 75, we didn't know whether he'd ever come back to see this place again. It was a very traumatic experience for us. And Grandma loved flowers, and she had to leave her flower garden. She had been, because she's 63, she spent much of her time uh, babysitting for her great-grandchildren and all, and that was a life with his, her family and, and grandchildren not too far from her in Florin. And all of this, we were being uprooted from this kind of life. Um, my husband was a strawberry salesman, and um, the, uh, he was also the field man for the Florin Fruit Growers Association. All of these jobs, we would have to leave, leave our home. We were very lucky to find Bob Fletcher, who was a wonderful friend. He was an inspect agricultural inspector, and he uh, promised to look after our farm and our two neighboring farms together. And it was a tremendous uh, request, but um, he was willing to take that responsibility and keep the vines alive and to be, live in our place so that he could keep an eye on our place. For that reason, we were able to leave Mariel's pet dog home, but otherwise we would have had to call the Humane Society to take the pets away. They had warned everyone. I was uh, executive secretary at that time, uh, relaying all the information that the government officials and the military people wanted the, the Japanese uh, evacuees to know about in preparing for their uh, departure and knowing what to do with their their uh, furniture and things they couldn't take. We were only allowed to take what we could carry. That meant refrigerators and bicycles and sewing machine and piano and all these big things had to be left. We had to sell our car. So it was a 
trying time when every single day meant picking berries. We had to pick these ripe berries that were rotting in the field. We were still in debt. We hadn't had time to pay back all our debts. Some of us had begun to, and we were feeling very hopeful that in a few years we would be free of all of this mortgage and debts, and we were leaving these debts as we saw the berries rotting and uh, had to leave. But um, we left from Elk Grove. Our friends came to take us so that we'd have a way to get to Elk Grove. And uh, the train station, by 9 o'clock, we were ready to depart. And so uh, it was a horrible nightmare to remember. And uh, elderly people and all of us, some of them were all dressed up because they were going somewhere away from their farm. But it seemed ridiculous, not knowing where we were going or how long we were going to be gone. Uh, we had to take our nice clothes and wear our hat and our coat. And here it was May and very hot, but that was easier to do that than to try to carry everything. And so the, the blankets and the rolls and canvas duffel bags were stuffed with things and old suitcases. And But uh, we were told to limit our baggage so that we took what we could just you know, felt we needed to take, but I was concerned about my family. I was concerned about feeding the family. And I had no idea what the military had planned so that I worried about them going hungry. I remember sneaking in three or four pound sack of rice in a cloth bag so that they could be wrapped up inside my blankets. And I remember collecting uh, packages of jello and uh, dehydrated soup and things like that because we wanted to be sure our family would have something to eat and crackers and things that were light. We found out later when we arrived there in Fresno after two hours ride and it was hot and, and we entered the gate and it clanged shut. We finally realized that our liberty was taken away. And as we looked up, we saw the watchtower with the military police with, uh, with their guns. And so immediately we, we realized that they had said we were going to uproot us and put us in a temporary relocation center. It sure didn't seem like a relocation center with the, uh, the watchtower. Many people had said, oh, no, you weren't in a concentration camp or a jail. The government had to move you, and they were going to temporarily put you in these places, but they were going to release you and move you to some inland community, or moving 110,000 to 120,000 people, and expect that to happen. You know, they were very naive to think that that would work. But we found out that many people who were told to voluntarily move and get out of their homes, some of some four or five thousand people did that. They drove away from the West Coast and went beyond Reno and tried to find a place to go. And every place they went, they found out that the community resisted their arrival, didn't want them to come, and they protested the government. And so finally the Army had to change the rules and say, nobody should go on their own. You must come back and stay put until we move you. That's why it happened, where the government had to control the our moving and uh, put us in a temporary place uh, like the Fresno Assembly Center which was used to be the Fresno Fairgrounds. So every community had a fairground. All the Stockton Fairground, Turlock Fairground, Wallerga was established in Sacramento for the people in Sacramento. Tamferan, the racetrack around Bay Area, all the people around San Francisco and the Bay Area people were put behind the fence that that surrounded the Tamferan racetracks. And so it was easy for them to empty the horse stalls and uh, put the families in these horse stalls. And so they all talked about the terrible, smelly place, and no windows, and, and just so stuffy. And uh, there were hastily put floors on these horse stalls. And as the months went by, weeds came up from between the, the cracks on the wood and uh, they could always smell the corner where the, the horse had urinated because no matter how much they tried to deodorize it, they couldn't take the smell away. So it was a very humiliating, degrading experience that faced the Japanese people. About 70 to 80,000 of us were American-born citizens of this country. And uh, about uh, 
twenty percent or twenty five percent of them were our parents who were born in Japan, who had come here as immigrants and had been here thirty or forty years. And because there was an immigration naturalization bill that was passed in 1924, they weren't allowed to become citizens. And so when the war broke out and Japan was the enemy, they became technically enemy aliens. Well, they decided that we would also be lumped together with our parents because our faces looked like the enemy. And before we had committed a single crime, they decided that it's best to get us put away because we might do something that would hurt the country. We might be spy, become spies or saboteurs and interfere with the security of the West Coast. So this word became popular. For military necessity, they must do this. That was their explanation, that they were going to move us because of military necessity. And we found out later, you know, we didn't have any idea what they were doing until later we found out that it wasn't just, it, we thought that it was everybody who were um, uh, people that looked like uh, the, the ally, the Axis countries. We were at war with Japan and Italy and Germany. But we found out that they just picked the people of Japanese ancestry only. And it was a very shocking, degrading thing to think that they couldn't trust us American citizens. They never asked us. They never gave us a chance to answer. They didn't call us to a hearing or to take us to court. We're not guilty until we're proven guilty. And so uh, we were supposed to be uh, put into jail only if there were two people that that stood up and there were witnesses that would proclaim that we had indeed committed something wrong. So all of these questions were in our hearts and it was a very upsetting, disappointing time to realize that citizenship didn't mean anything then. And so when the door, the gates clanged and we, we were finally behind the Fresno Assembly Center and finally got into our assigned room, we, they called it apartments, but it was just a small room, no bigger than this room, 25 by 20. Our family of six were put there, and we found the asphalt floor was uh, soft because it was so hot in Fresno, and we found the, the tar melting from the ceiling onto our beds, and the, the only thing that they gave us was a cot, canvas cot, and we had to stuff uh, uh, straw into these um, bags that became our mattresses. And uh, we made our own mattress with straw stuffed in it. And uh, that was all there was in the room. And so we had to sit on our beds. And um, we had no closet or nothing. And so we brought our baggage and our, our suitcases were piled in the middle of the room. And we just sat there wondering just how we were going to organize ourselves to live in a place like this. But as days went by, we did, you know, and the, then all of a sudden we heard the dishpan being banged, and we found out that was called for dinner. And um, there was no running hot water or running water or anything in these little rooms. It was just a bed. And we found out that if we needed to go to the toilet, we had to go to a community in the block. There, there was a, a building where we were to share our uh, shower and our, our bath and uh, toilet facilities uh, in Fresno Assembly Center. It was like the typical army facility, I guess, because we had never seen anything like that, a little hut. And it was screened on the upper half of it was screened, and we heard something with water running, and all of a sudden, once in a while, we hear a big bang and something splash. But we stood in a line to go to the uh, latrine, and when the when we opened the door, I was shocked to find the people, the girls were seated. There were six holes, and there were people seated, you know, back to back. And I just couldn't imagine that this is the way we had to shame ourselves. We were so we had never been. We had been modest people and private people, and this was a shock to find that this was the kind of facilities we had to use. 
I guess for the men or for the boys or the army people, the soldiers, they were used to something like that. But we just, we were just horrified to think that girls and children and women were also involved in a place like that. It was a temporary place. They had to very hastily build many barracks. And a barrack was 120 feet long, and it was divided into five or six little rooms, and so the families were assigned to live in such a place. And then when the bell or the gong was sounded, we went into another barrack where there were tables all close together, and we had to crowd ourselves in there to sit down and eat the food that they had prepared. There was a the quartermaster group that did the purchasing and there were uh, evacuees and people who were hired for $12 a month or $16 a month to cook and wash dishes and serve food and nobody was happy. Everybody was grumbling and griping and yelling at the top of their voices so we felt very ashamed and um, humiliated to be surrounded in such an atmosphere and it was so hot and none of us remembered that we needed fans and so we got busy and we found out people were ordering like crazy over uh, the, the things that they could order through Co Montgomery Ward and Sears Robot Catalog was very popular. And we realized that we needed to have a table and chairs and it wasn't, we couldn't build them fast enough. Some of the people found scraps of wood and scrap the crates in the back of the mess hall where they could get uh, fruit crates and break them up and make them into furnitures and chairs. But um, but um, we ordered a car table set and chairs, and uh, we had to buy some clothes. We found out that every bit of clothing that we brought were too good to wear in a place where everything got dirty and dusty, and so we had to buy some informal kinds of clothes and slacks and shorts and things because it was so hot. So we were busy doing something like that and spent the few dollars that we had to um, try to manage to survive in a place like that. There were about seven or 8,000 people in this Fresno Assembly Center. And in, such, in the same way, there were people in the Santa Anita racetracks, thousands of them, 20,000 of them from all the Los Angeles area and the Tamparan uh, racetracks. And so uh, each uh, fairground uh, in Tulare and Pomona and Salinas, all of these uh, fairgrounds were temporarily converted into a assembly center where they kept us. And, uh, and uh, then in a few months, four or five months, uh, the inland relocation camps were more or less ready. They had 10 places that they had selected that had to be government property that they could quickly build uh, relocation uh, camps and build the barracks and all of that. And my brother went about a month ahead, you know, from Fresno. They recruited the Vanguard team, that young men that could volunteer to go and help the construction people in these relocation camps so that they uh, went ahead and uh, wrote to us about the conditions on the train. It was a four day and five night ride and that for children and people who have uh, were sick and old people, they told us we need to bring blankets and pillows on the train because we were going to sleep right where we sat. And they told us to be sure to bring snacks for the children because they're going to get hungry between meals. And so all of these things were uh, warned and uh, we started to get things ready. But you know, I didn't uh, stop to tell you that even though we were in Fresno on a temporary basis, there were some people who had been there, who had been in college, who decided that we're, we just can't exist in a vacuum, or we can't just, just uh, fall into a lethargy and do nothing. And so uh, they started to recruit the people who had been to college to uh, volunteer to be school teachers and that they were going to hastily organize a, a emergency summer school kind of a school program for children. Because otherwise we saw kids running around wild all over and nothing to do and they were getting into trouble and they were kids all ages. Now it was interesting, I can't remember the figures, but they said a great 
percentage of the evacuees that were sent into these camps. A majority of them were little kids in school, high school kids, and some were in college. Mm -hmm. And very few had already been out of college or into a profession, but we did have a few doctors and lawyers and people like that. They all had to close up their offices and leave their profession. If they had one sixteenth blood, Japanese blood, nobody was excluded. So that all of the Japanese, we have poor farmers and rich people and the rice growers, Mr. Koda, who had the large rice uh, fields, and he was a very wealthy man. They were all there together. We were all together on this uh, evacuation. Uh, no one was excluded from this experience. And so uh, the, uh, we were uh, in these places, and uh, we tried to try to bring some kind of order to the, the chaos that we saw all around us. And so we organized a summer school program and Ines Nagai is one of the few people that we knew about that had a job as a junior high physical education teacher in Fresno. And this was very rare because we knew about a few professors who had gotten jobs who were Japanese Americans in the colleges. But in the elementary, we didn't know of anyone. But Ines Nagai became the uh, superintendent and she organized the school. And so I was asked if I would do something. Of course, I had to open my mouth and tell them that I learned public speaking from Mabel Barron. Maybe I could teach that. And so I had a, uh, adult, uh, the uh, high school kids, a few high school kids. Not everyone was interested in going to school. Why should they? You know, they were going to have a wonderful summer vacation. But there were people that were getting very tired and sick of doing nothing and frightened about what would happen in the future. So they were there desperate. And so I had some adults in this high school class, and we did try to do some uh, public speaking and practice extemporaneous speaking. And I realized then how important it was for all of us not to be too shy, but to speak out and learn to express ourselves, and that communication skills were important. But I don't know. I didn't know that much about public speaking beside, except the, what I had learned from Mabel. And it, we tried to do what we could. And there were uh, school uh, teachers who took the, the junior uh, uh, high school classes or some the elementary level. And some handled the uh, Girl Scouts got interested in running the preschool program. And they were getting their badges and uh, rewards for learning to do this. And so there were people that were involved in all kinds of uh, club activities and church work. And so we were trying to be busy. We even built an amphitheater where we could have a graduation exercise for the high school students that missed their graduation. They had to leave home before they got their diplomas. And so some of the high school principals came in to give them their diplomas. And it was wonderful to know that at least they could get their diploma, but their schooling was interrupted. Many had left colleges and universities to come into camp. And it was such a waste of human energy and resources, such a waste of these farmers that were working to raise fruits and vegetables and food for our nation at war. It was a ridiculous story of all of us just being idle there. I remember we returned to Florin on uh, uh, July, uh, a middle of July in 1945. That was three and a half years after we had been away. And we drove in from uh, Gila, Arizona, where we had visited Al's parents, because they were still in the Gila relocation camp. We were sent to Jerome uh, first, but when Jerome closed, all of them were scattered again, and they were moved to Gila, Arizona. So we stopped there. But we had um, Al's uh, brother-in-law's car we had used, and so we drove home. And it was early in the morning, and every, nobody was around, nobody was walking, and we were frightened because we had heard that the reception for the soldiers who had come back early to look, at, look over the farm to see if there was a chance of their family returning from these relocation camps, 
um, they came to find out what the situation was and found the reception very bad, that Mukai's farm was burned and that the people who decided to come early enough to prune their vine vineyards in January found that peop some of the people were very cold and uh, it frightened them to know what, uh, what they would um, be able to accomplish. And of course, they, they, they found that their cars didn't have the tires were all gone and and if they had their car stored they had a difficult time getting tires for the because tire rationing was still on the war was not over in 1945 in July and so then there was gas rationing and so there were difficulties because they were away for three and a half years and many of them uh, families had sons already in the war, so they weren't there to help them. Some of the servicemen who were already discharged because maybe they were hurt or something, and they were discharged early, then came to look and found that barber shops wouldn't uh, cut their hair. There were some restaurants that they wouldn't feed them. And so they knew that the reception was not very good. And uh, so they worried about uh, all of this and we heard about it so we waited till July we we knew that we were allowed to return in January of 45 but we waited but things were beginning to improve because the government suddenly realized that the people got the message if the government could get away with mistreating us or discriminating us and driving us out they all felt the right you know to treat whatever they felt like treating us because we were part of the enemy and the uh, war um, uh, propaganda kind of uh, message they were continually getting all during the years uh, took root in their heads so that it was easy for them to feel that it was okay to, you know, just ignore us or mistreat us or whatever. But some of them were our friends and uh, neighbors passed. And many of them, I found out, were rather afraid to come to talk to us because they knew what a terrible experience we had been through. And so they were afraid to come and ashamed to come and talk to us. But we interpreted that as being that they weren't very glad to see us. So there was misunderstanding there. But later we found out how deeply they had suffered too because they realized we were treated unfairly and that it was war and that all of us had suffered through the war. But we not only suffered as the rest of the people did, we also sent our boys overseas and our, our Nisei boys volunteered from the camps and made such a wonderful uh, military record, the, the highest number of casualties and the greatest amount of decorations were awarded these boys because they knew they had to fight not only to win the war for our country, but they were also fighting to do away with bigotry and prejudice and discrimination. And they knew they had to give their all. So they, many of them were AWOL, left the hospitals to go back to the front. Some of them received a Purple Heart many times because they remembered their parents and their families behind barbed wire fences and needed to free them. And so this is the kind of background that we have as we were returning. So you can imagine how disappointed these boys must have been who came back early and found that the reception wasn't good. And when we complained and the government realized what had happened, they then realized that they needed to do something about counteracting this kind of uh, sentiment by building up goodwill. And then many of the other white soldiers who had been in the battlefields who knew about the Japanese Americans returned to their communities and complained and protested to the editors and wrote letters uh, to the editors in their newspapers when they saw unfair statements being written up trying to keep us from returning. And so there were many people that started to work to build up goodwill, and, and then the FBI men were sent to California to make speeches to the service clubs and organizations so that they would begin to understand what a terrible thing did happen, but that it wasn't uh, the right thing to do to continue with this kind of hatred and discrimination. But you know, uh, 
one big terrible mistake done by the government or the, the events that followed the, after the war and the painful, humiliating things that happened to a people, it sure is hard to correct it, you know, immediately and took a long time. So this is the kind of an atmosphere we were returning. So we were afraid more than anything else. So some of the friends who were special, and many of them even lost their own Caucasian friends to dare to be kind to us. They were called Jap lovers. And so it was hard for many of the, the Caucasian neighbors that we had and white friends who wanted to be nice to us, but then they worried about their status in their community with the attitude the others had. So it was very difficult time for them too. But as we came home, and of course, my, because my husband was uh, very fortunate to have Bob Fletcher as our friend, we found our place and, and our home in, in good order and everything was there and our grapes were well cared for. So this is what we returned to. And as the camps gradually had to close and the government said that they're going to insist on people leaving it was a very difficult thing for many people who had sold their property while they were in camp because they still owed money and they couldn't pay the, make the payments. Or someone offered them three or four thousand dollars, which might have been worth thirty or forty thousand. But when they were in camp and they read the headlines that said that there was a group that was campaigning to ship us out of this country to another island, that there was a group that was trying to introduce a bill in legislature that we would be pre uh, prevented from returning to the West Coast ever again. All of these things frighten us. And they, we even saw the incredible bill that was introduced to try to take our citizenship away. And we thought, my goodness, what's happened to this world? We were certainly upset and uh, Many people made ha hasty decisions then. We uh, uh, knew that uh, and had faith that someday we would get a chance to return to California. So we didn't sell our property, but some of them did. So they had no place to go to. And so this was a very hard thing for I have to come home to Florin and not be able to get back into their homes. And so then um, we, uh, found out that some neighbors offered their barn or their, their chicken coops and, and uh, some of the Seno children came home from the, uh, the son was in the war and the daughters had been working in Washington. The young people had gone out of camp to get jobs first because the parents um, couldn't go out so they remained in camp. And then when they were s urged to return home, they did come home but they had no place to go. When uh, Nellie came home, she found her parents living in the chicken coop and she cried. And there wasn't anything to do. Her brother was still in the army and hadn't come home to help the parents get settled. So there were many, many things happening. And of course we had to gradually, when the, uh, the, store, uh, the freight and things that were stored in the Methodist Church uh, community hall, and gradually that place was emptied out. Some of the families then hung uh, uh, blankets and sheets as uh, walls and started to have little compartments just like it was in camp. And they were allowed to stay there until they could find a place. So there were many, many untold stories of hardships as they returned. And they each, if they didn't return to their farm or could return to their farm, they had to find a new place, a community where they would find a home to stay, a job to keep. And so all of these, uh, it took many, many years for people to get back on their feet. Many people lost uh, all that they had, and uh, they had to start all over again. Some of the houses were burned, so nothing was there. Some of the homes were abandoned by people who promised to rent their property and um, uh, run their farm, but they found out the work was too hard and they couldn't keep it up. And so they would move, then somebody else would move in there. Nobody knew who took the things in the barn or the tools or the equipment or the, some of the things they left in their houses. So people lost things for many, many reasons. And um, 
it was a very hard time. About 50% of the people returned once to Florin. Some of them had to settle their, their and realize that the handwriting was on the wall. The, the Florin could never become the community it once had with the stores and the business uh, proto-shipping companies that had folded up because of the evacuation order. There was no money to start that kind of business again, and there wasn't anyone who could advance them money to uh, buy the plants, to plant strawberries again, and help them with the expenses of, uh, of a fertilizer and everything before the strawberry crop, crop was ready to be harvested. So gradually, Florin deteriorated and died. It took about 10 years. A few people came back and raised strawberries. And one company tried to keep it going, but it was just a losing battle. And so gradually, and the, the Issei's, the, our parents were getting older, and the young people, the Nisei's, found other jobs, and because they were educated and could speak English, they gradually, the State Department and the federal government jobs were opening up, and they got jobs at the Campbell Soup and frozen food plants, and some of them started their own garages or businesses, and so it took many years for these things to be established, but they gradually did, and this is the way we uh, returned and raised strawberries and grapes for a few years, but the prices changed and dropped. And we found out that after the war, things had changed. The price had changed for the grape vineyard, uh, vineyards too. And so we had to quit uh, farming. And that's when my husband started to look for a new job and the Army Depot was being established a few, just five minutes away from our farm. And many Niseis got a job there and it was a on-the-spot training kind of a program. And he was a farmer, never had any training for radar equipment or repairing equipment like that, but they trained him and gradually got a job and uh, stayed there for 30 years working for the federal government. Well, in the meantime, I was looking for a job, and Isabel Jackson looked at me and asked why I wouldn't consider going into teaching, because she, she saw me helping the Girl Scouts, and I had produced a puppet show on Hansel and Gretel and taught them singing and things like that. So this is how we began to get back to normal again.